Breaking tonight, the U.S. taking out a top militant commander blamed for planning a deadly attack on American forces. Officials announcing the drone strike targeted an Iranian-backed militia leader in Baghdad. It's all in response to recent attacks on U.S. forces in the region, including one that killed U.S. troops in Jordan. Where things stand as concerns over stability in the Middle East grows. Also tonight, the search for missing Marines. A desperate search and rescue mission underway after a military helicopter goes missing. The chopper later discovered in a California forest. Rescue crews battling feet of snow, making the effort to find the Marines a challenge. The latest on the search and if weather could have played a factor. Nevada, not for Nikki. Former UN ambassador losing to no one in the Nevada GOP primary. Defeated by double digits by the ballot option, none of these candidates. Why former President Trump was never on that ballot. Plus, the growing questions tonight about RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel after Trump said she might need to step down. Inside the mega prison, a rare look tonight into the largest prison in Latin America. Since its creation, El Salvador's murder rate has plummeted, but the incarceration rate, the highest in the world. The president touting its success as human watch. Uh, watch groups argue innocent people have been wrongly charged. Plus, toying with danger, a family suing a school district after their daughter is shot with an Orbeez gun. The teen recovering from a serious eye injury after she was caught in the crossfire of a popular game. Why her family says the school is to blame. Orcas escape, a pot of killer whales trapped in an ice strip, able to break free. How experts believe they managed to survive. And this photo of a polar bear taking a snooze on an ice cap is not just melting hearts, it's winning awards, we'll explain. And grandma firefighter, a 75-year-old, joining the front lines after surviving the deadliest wildfire in California's history. Her inspiring story proving you can be a rookie at any age. Top story starts right now. All right, let's get right to that breaking news tonight. The U.S. announcing it has killed a top militia commander blamed for planning the drone attack that killed U.S. soldiers in Jordan. The Iranian-backed militant leader was killed in a U.S. drone strike that hit a car in eastern Baghdad. These are pictures that have come into our newsroom. It comes on the heels on Friday and, and Saturday's U.S.-led retaliatory strikes for attacks on American troops in the region. President Biden vowed last week that the U.S. response would be ongoing. New images just in show the aftermath of the latest drone strike, a burnt-out car being lifted by a crane after the vehicle was engulfed in flames. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons starts us off on this breaking news from inside the region. Tonight, a vehicle in flames in the Iraqi capital. A U.S. strike so targeted, cars close by appear undamaged, others driving past. But in the aftermath, fury erupting. A crowd chanting no to America, no to Israel. Among those killed, Abu Bakr al Saadi, a commander in Qatab Hezbollah, the group says. The Iranian-backed militia accused of the killing of three American service members in a drone attack on Tower 22, a remote desert base in Jordan, 10 days ago. CENTCOM saying in a statement tonight, U.S. forces conducted a unilateral strike in Iraq in response to the attacks on U.S. service members, killing a Kateb Hezbollah commander responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces in the region. In addition to the deadly drone strike, Iranian-backed militias have launched over 160 attacks on American targets since October and have kept on attacking American bases in Syria, even after Friday's wave of American retaliatory strikes. President Biden, who's been under pressure to launch a more forceful response, was pressed about it earlier this week. Are the airstrikes working? Yes. Tonight, Iraq's military immediately branding the strike a violation of Iraqi sovereignty, with tensions between Iran and the U.S., escalating. All right, Kier joins us tonight from Erbil, Iraq, on this breaking news. So, Kier, what more are we learning about this strike? Well, NBC News, Tom, is just hearing from a U.S. official telling us that Iraq was informed of the strike shortly afterwards, but that the president made the decision to carry out this strike early last week. Effectively, it looks like the same time as he decided to launch that operation on Friday night, but that it was only now that the opportunity presented itself to target this figure within this group, Qatab Hezbollah. 
And then, you know, it's interesting because we keep striking at these commanders, and yet there's been no strike on Iran, correct? That's exactly right. And again, this is uh, targeting of uh, a commander, according to the group itself, uh, in an Iranian-backed militia. So it's, it's an Iranian-backed group. It's not Iran itself, despite the fact that at the beginning of all this, uh, the US said that it, it would be targeting the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Now, maybe it did on Friday night. Maybe some of those buildings were both Iranian-backed militia and Revolutionary Guard, Al-Quds Force, as they're, as they're called, outside uh, um, of Iran. Perhaps that's the case. But, Tom, ultimately, uh, there is this. Uh, no US president since Carter has launched an operation inside of Iran. It would be incredibly escalatory, and for that reason, it would be a huge decision for President Biden to take. But so far, he hasn't hit Iranian targets even outside of Iran, beyond these, uh, these buildings and this Iranian-backed uh, militia. So there is a lot that President Biden might do or could do that would escalate things further before striking a target inside of Iran itself. All right, Keir Simmons for us. Keir, thank you for that. Back here at home to our other major headline of a desperate search in the hills east of San Diego after a Marine Corps helicopter crashed, but its crew is still missing tonight. Officials say five Marines were aboard when it vanished from radar overnight. Dana Griffin has more. Tonight, the urgent search for five missing Marines, their helicopter disappearing overnight in a remote area of San Diego County during a routine training flight. Our crews are out in this rugged terrain. It's slippery, it's muddy out, uh, we have snow. Military officials confirming the missing helo was located this morning. Now, a rescue effort for the five on board. All were assigned to the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. They were flying a CH-53E Super Stallion helicopter like this one. In a statement, the Marines say the crew departed from Creech Air Force Base near Las Vegas Tuesday night, heading to Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego County. Super Stallion is primarily used for transporting heavy equipment. It was last detected around 11.30 p.m. Tuesday, according to CAL FIRE, 50 miles east of its destination. Once the aircraft was reported overdue, search and rescue teams were dispatched. They had to go on foot to search the area of the coordinates of the last known location of that helicopter. Overnight, conditions near the crash were a mix of rain and heavy snow. It's unclear if the severe weather was a factor in the crash. All right, Dana Griffin joins us now live. Dana, what more do we know about the search for the Marines right now? So, Tom, I can tell you that a caravan of search and rescue crews came into the staging area. Another group went out, so it is safe to say that at this hour they are still searching the snow-covered, rugged terrain. Officials have not given us an update on the search and rescue, but we can also tell you that a similar helicopter crashed in California just over five years ago during a, another training mission where, unfortunately, Tom, four Marines were killed in that crash. Yeah, Dana, and I want to ask you about that, right, because you look at the size of that helicopter, and it's not easy to kind of evacuate a helicopter. It's not an ejector seat like you can in a jet, and that's not easy either. What, yeah. Do we know what leads the military to believe and give them hope that maybe these Marines are still alive? Well, it's possible that they may have crash landed and maybe those Marines tried to walk out. Maybe they are trying to find their way back. Remember, we're in a pretty remote area, so you may not know which direction you're walking to. So that is the hope. We also don't know if they have found any of them. If they have, the Marines usually notify next to kin first. So we won't know any details until they release that information. But obviously, the hope is that those Marines survived and everyone is wishing them well, hoping that they come back home. Yeah, Tom. that is right. Dana Griffin live from that search base camp tonight for us. Dana, we appreciate your reporting. For more insight on this and into the crash and the challenges that lie ahead for the search teams, I'm joined tonight by rescue expert and survivalist Tom Coyne. He's the founder of Coyne Survival Schools. Tom, if these Marines survived the crash landing, as we were just talking about there, if they were able to walk off the helicopter, jump off it just in time, can they survive in those mountains in these conditions? Yeah, so these are strong, capable, well-trained individuals. So if the crash was survivable, I, I don't have any information on uh, the, the condition the aircraft was found. However, if the crash was survivable, 
these kind of people, Marine air crew, Marine pilots like this are in some of the best uh, position to survive it. They're all gonna have some level of training on what to do after a crash. Um, I'm, former, uh, I'm a former hell attack firefighter and even guys like me got dunker trained what to do if we went down in the water. So they know what to do when they strike the ground. Uh, the the, the hel helicopter is gonna be equipped with certain firefighting systems it's going to be equipped with some survival gear. The pilot may even have some survival gear in their flight suit, uh, which is fairly, uh, fairly standard operating uh, procedure. So uh, if it is survivable, now normally uh, these people are taught to stay near the aircraft because it's much easier to find a giant helicopter in the wilderness than um, <clears throat> an individual. What I'm hoping is, is since they're not near the aircraft, which is quite odd, right? I'm hoping that because of the storm, because they have probably some level of survival training. Uh, the, the pilot especially, it may have even gotten a full-blown survival course from, from the Marines, uh, that they just went and sheltered up uh, through the storm, and uh, they're gonna be found just a, a little cold and hungry. That are, uh, that's the hope. And if anybody's in a condition to survive uh, something like that, it's people with this, this, that kind of training. So you bring up a good point. The training is to stay by the helicopter because it's such a large, uh, I guess, a, l a large marker from the sky if you're if you're searching. Yeah, exactly. So for one, uh, all their all their clothing is going to be camouflaged, right? So there's not a, they're not exactly going to stand out in that mix chaparral and tinder out there, and it's much harder to find them than the helicopter and pieces of the helicopter can even or parts of the helicopter can even come in handy uh, for sheltering or, or, or shading up. That helicopter uh, may also be equipped, all civilian uh, um, aircraft are, are, are equipped with GPS devices that go off when you crash automatically. They sense a certain amount of G-force, they start pinging. So that also means you're more likely to be found from uh, from the PLB going off. So, Tom, you know, we're showing our viewers where this was, uh, where this happened and where it was located. Can we put that, that back up there, please, that map, so we can take a look at it one more time? Um, these, these kind of mountains in the winter, is this survivable? If, if they're not by the helicopter, can they survive this exposed to the elements? Well, the, the, the big consideration there that is that these are Marines, uh, so that, that's going to take uh, a big part of it. They're trained. Uh, to endure a lot and and mentally and physically uh, they're there. So they are at about three four thousand feet. Conditions kind of suck right now because it's right in between freezing and wet. That is some of the most dangerous. You would almost rather it be a hundred percent frozen because being cold and wet is a whole different situation. It's it's much harder to light a fire when it's wet uh, than in the snow as well. So it is difficult. It is very steep. It is arduous. Uh, terrain. However, it is only hovering around freezing uh, overnight. Uh, they should have good gear. They should have survival gear with the ship. And I believe for these types of individuals, uh, as long as when they hit the ground, uh, they were okay. I, I believe it's quite survivable. Would you be able to hike down those mountains uh, without any trail markers, without sort of any paths that have been carved out? Or would that be too difficult? Because I'm wondering, you know, you, you would know if you were going down, if you were headed down the mountain, but I, I just wonder if that's even possible. So once, once you have an emergency in the air, the pilot's going to start looking around for the best landing zones, right? He's going to look, he or she is going to look around uh, for the best places to set the aircraft down, if that is possible. And if they see a, a major road system or something like that nearby, perhaps because of the conditions, because you know, the, the, the mix of rain and snow and wind, uh, if they saw something nearby, uh, the, it may be worth leaving the how taking the gear that you can, leaving the helicopter and, and going for it. Um, if that is the case, then I believe that they'll, they'll, they'll be found shortly. All right, we hope you're right. Tom, we appreciate your time and your analysis tonight here on Top Story. Also in California, at least nine people confirmed dead after that severe weather swept across the state. More than 400 mudslides reported in the Los Angeles area. And tonight, with the ground dangerously saturated, a new storm moving into the region, threatening even more damage. Let's get right over to NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, before you start, I know you were listening to our conversation there. What type of weather is over the search area right now where those missing Marines are, 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 are thought to be located? Yeah, things got quiet. It was raining this morning. Things got quiet. It actually snowed 
going at the level where the aircraft was. Um, and then that quieted down. The problem is that we have this next storm coming in. So as the search and rescue operation is going on, we have roughly about six hours until we get another batch of rain and snow that will be moving right over the crash site. So, And then by the time the sun comes up, this storm will be gone. So uh, we'll have difficult conditions probably for about maybe three hours or so. They'll probably have to stand down on what they're doing as the storm goes through. And then in the morning, everything should be fine from then all day tomorrow. So here's a look at the storm I'm talking about. Went through San Francisco. You're done. It's right over the top of Fresno. And this, thankfully, is moving fast. It, it packs a punch. I mean, this has heavy rain with it. It's even had some lightning with it at times. The snow levels are pretty low, so the mountain passes are going to be a problem, even outside of Los Angeles. So here it is coming on shore around San Luis Obispo. Here's the Fillmore area. Here's Los Angeles. So L.A., it's right around maybe 10 p.m. or midnight or so. It looks like when we'll start to see the rain in your area. So here's the timing of it. You notice as it heads down here through San Diego, it's pretty quick. By 8 a.m., it's done. It's over with. So for the crash of, you know, operations and rescue, hopefully, uh, that should be fine during the daylight hours. Then this all moves into Utah and areas of southern uh, possibly the heaviest snow will be in actually areas of Arizona up on the rim just south of Flagstaff. So Los Angeles, you're back under a flood watch again. 19 million people, including Oceanside, all the way down to San Diego. This is not the eight to nine inches, but because of all those mudslides, so many hills are just barely holding on. And if we add another inch of rain quickly, what we're afraid of is that additional hillsides will give way and we'll get those rock slides and those debris flows, Tom. And that would be occurring late tonight during the overnight hours. Uh, hopefully it won't be too bad, but it is possible. Okay, I know you're going to stay monitoring that, Bill. We appreciate that. We want to move to Capitol Hill now and the breakdown in Congress. Tonight, over that border security bill and funding for Ukraine and Israel, this coming after the embarrassing failure by House Republicans to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. NBC's Ryan Nobles has been covering it all for us, and here he is with his report. Tonight, Capitol Hill in a state of chaos. It's a big leadership challenge that we need to find a solution for. 24 hours after that embarrassing defeat for Republicans, narrowly failing to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas following a dramatic turn of events. Democrat Al Green rushed from his hospital bed to cast the deciding vote against it. Republicans had accused Mayorkas of unlawfully allowing millions of migrants to cross into the U.S. The House Speaker tonight vowing to hold another vote when a top Republican returns from medical treatment. Mayorkas needs to be held accountable. The Biden administration needs to be held accountable, and we will pass those articles of impeachment. While the Senate tonight attempting to start the process to push through a new bill with funding for Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine. Money supporters say is critical with a new round of strikes by Russia on the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. But that package had originally included billions for border security, too. Bipartisan negotiators touted an increase in detention centers and raising the standards for asylum. But GOP critics slammed the proposal, saying it was not tough enough, and that President Biden could solve the crisis by bringing back Trump border policies. The deal was voted down today. You think so many, House Republicans are as interested in bipartisanship at this point? Well, what they're going to have to do is show their ability to govern, right? NBC's Morgan Chesky is on the border in Eagle Pass, Texas. Crossings here are down at the moment, but firefighters tell us they've been overwhelmed, especially after seeing migrants drown while trying to cross the Rio Grande. Can any of you even count the number of body recoveries you've been a part of it anymore? I lost count. I'm hoping that the federal government will cut a deal and completely stop this madness. One conservative Republican telling us he's fine with the gridlock. Could that mean like a government shutdown in the near future? Well, it could be as far as I'm concerned. I mean, most of my voters would love to see this place shut down because they don't think it works for them. But Speaker Johnson with a different view. What would you say to Americans concerned that Congress isn't able to do basic functions? Well, it's just simply not true. We're, we're, we're governing here. Sometimes it's messy. Okay, with that, Ryan joins us once again from Capitol Hill. Ryan, Speaker Johnson is already being threatened that he will be ousted by at least one notable congresswoman if they bring any Ukraine aid bill to a vote. Yeah, that's right. Marjorie Taylor Greene has said that many times in the past. But, you know, the speaker has said multiple times that he's at least open to the idea of bringing Ukraine aid to the floor if it's conditioned with a ton of oversight that doesn't currently exist in the prior aid packages. So he hasn't completely ruled it out as a possibility. It's just the form and fashion in which he'd bring it to the floor that's still an open question. He's already signaled that if this Senate bill does end up passing on the Senate side of the House, of the Capitol, 
that he may be forced to not even bring it up at all for a vote or break it up into individual pieces and have each piece of the po of the possible legislation voted on separately, Tom. So, Ryan, get us up to speed. Where does that stand right now? So the Senate has decided that they are going to go home for the night, that a new piece of legislation where they've pulled the border package out of the broader supplemental piece is still a pending situation. There's negotiations happening right now between Republicans and Democrats. Ironically, Tom, one of the things that we're hearing is that Republicans are ask, actually asking for amendments to this legislation in which the border package was pulled out that would be amendments that would deal with the border situation, which was something that was already part of the original package. So senators are trying to find a way to make this happen. They hope they can get something passed by the weekend, but all of it right now is up in the air. Tom. Okay, Ryan Nobles for us. Ryan, thank you for that. Now to power in politics and a shocking defeat for Nikki Haley in Nevada. The former U.N. ambassador losing to no one in the state's GOP primary, defeated by the ballot option, quote, none of these candidates. Yeah, the spot that says none of these candidates. That slot got more votes than she did. Why former President Trump was never on that ballot and the big win he's expecting in the state in tomorrow night's caucus. It's a little confusing. Von Hiller's going to explain it all for us. What a great looking crowd. Tonight, a stunning rebuke of Nikki Haley in Nevada, losing to no one. With former President Trump's name not even appearing on the state's primary ballot, the former U.N. ambassador losing by double digits to the ballot option, none of these candidates. I voted none of the above for the primary here, and I'll be at the caucus on Thursday. I think everybody believes it's going to be uh, Donald Trump anyway. Haley electing to participate in Nevada's state-run primary, not Thursday's party-run caucus, as former President Trump opted to do, despite the fact that the caucus is the only contest that actually awards delegates. Talk to the people in Nevada. They will tell you the caucuses have been sealed up, bought, and paid for for a long time. Haley accused the Nevada Republican Party of being in the bag for Trump, its party chairman even endorsing Trump and campaigning for him. I give you the next president of the United States. Donald J. Trump! The chair, just one of the party leaders here, indicted on criminal charges in the state for being alleged fake electors after the 2020 election. So thank you very much, and thank you, Michael. I'm thrilled to be back in Las Vegas. Haley's staggering loss here only further damaging her efforts to invigorate an anti-Trump movement in the party. A campaign spokesperson saying in a statement, we're full steam ahead in South Carolina and beyond. She has vowed to fight it out through at least her home state primary in two and a half weeks, and then on Super Tuesday, March 5th. But already, Jesus hates Haley running into boisterous, loyal support for the former president while at a campaign stop in California. While they are loud and chaotic, that is every reason we have to get motivated. And as Trump is set to fly to Las Vegas Thursday for a caucus night victory party, his presence felt on the national GOP stage as well. Just days after he suggested RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel may need to step down amid criticism of her leadership in the party. I would say right now uh, there'll probably be some changes made. The RNC suggesting that might just happen, saying in a statement, this will be decided after South Carolina. Okay, Von Hillier joins us tonight live from the campaign trail in Las Vegas. So, Von, McDaniel has been one of Trump's most vocal supporters on the national stage, and he handpicked her in 2017 to lead the party when he won the White House. So what happened at the RNC for Trump to suggest it's now time for her to move on? Was it the debates this year? Right. There are deep frustrations. Yes, Donald Trump has won this nomination or almost won this nomination handily. But look, after not only losing the White House in 2020 and losing uh, key races, not only for governor, but Senate seats in 2022, there is a marked number of fundraising dollars that have been uh, reported here in just the last week. At the end of 2023, the RNC only had eight million dollars cash on hand. Compare that to the DNC, which had more than $20 million cash on hand. I was talking to an RNC uh, committee member just this afternoon who told me it is in disarray in the RNC right now as there is deliberation and debate over what the future of it is. There is only nine months left until November's general election, Tom, and this is a moment in which the Republican Party does not want to be having inner turmoil, but that is what across the country RNC members are now currently debating as they look to who the RNC chair may be, and it could even stick and continue to be Ron and McDaniel, but we won't know until after that South Carolina primary.
on February 24th. Tom. And then there were some sort of rumors today, some some reporting, some tweets, if you will, about former Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. I is that true or are those just rumors? There are a number of names being thrown out there. It's notable that Matt Gates, the controversial Florida congressman, who was one of the leading House members to oust Kevin McCarthy from Speaker, was the one who first floated Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy was known as a successful fundraiser for House Republicans, yet at the same time, uh, it's questionable whether uh, Kevin McCarthy, after retiring from Congress just uh, two months ago, would be eager to get back into the ballgame in this capacity. Tom? Yeah, especially in this environment. Okay, Vaughn Hilliard for us. Vaughn, we always appreciate you. Heading back overseas now into Israel tonight, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is dismissing the latest proposal by Hamas for a ceasefire and hostage release after four months of war. Raf Sanchez reports on that and a new tunnel in Gaza that Israel says was used by Hamas leaders to hold those hostages. Tonight, Secretary of State Antony Blinken insisting there's still a path to a deal to free Israeli hostages after Israel's prime minister rejected a new list of demands from Hamas. Clearly, there are um, things that Hamas sent back that are absolute non-starters. But at the same time, uh, we see in, uh, in what was sent back uh, space to continue to pursue uh, an agreement. Hamas was responding to an American-backed proposal, saying it will free all its hostages in exchange for a four-and-a-half-month ceasefire, leading to an end to the war, the release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners, and a total withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza. Tonight, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling the Hamas proposal delusional. Giving in to Hamas's bizarre demands not only won't bring the release of hostages, it will just invite another massacre, he said. In Gaza, Israeli strikes hitting the city of Rafah. Mohammed stares at his hands, shaking uncontrollably. In Han Yunus, we followed Israeli troops deep underground into what they say was a tunnel for top Hamas leaders. This is years of building. And then a disturbing discovery. The Israeli military says this was a cage where at least three Israeli hostages were held. You can see there is a slot for what they say was delivering food. And here, a lock from the outside. Somewhere in these tunnels, more hostages waiting desperately for a deal. All right, Raf joins us tonight from Tel Aviv. Raf, the way you end your report there, it's a good reminder if anyone needs one of what's at stake here, right? So where do these negotiations go from here? So, Tom, Hamas says it is sending a senior delegation to Cairo to continue the negotiations. Now, on the one hand, that is a positive sign because it shows that from Hamas's perspective, despite that pretty flat rejection from Prime Minister Netanyahu tonight, they feel these negotiations are worth continuing. As you heard from Secretary Blinken, he feels there is still a path forward. But it is also a sign, Tom, that this deal remains far from being agreed. There is going to be more back and forth before we get to a final agreement. Secretary Blinken meeting tomorrow with the families of some of those hostages. He says their pain is unimaginable. You know, Raf, you, you've taken our viewers into these tunnels a few times now from your reporting there in Israel and in Gaza. What, what have you sort of pulled from your experience inside these tunnels and what have you learned? It's really striking, Tom. When you get to the entrances of these tunnels, there is just a wave of hot, damp air that hits you right in the face. It is so striking how long these tunnels are, how deep they are. You are just walking in darkness minute after minute after minute. Uh, and what you find yourself thinking as you walk through is what must the hostages have felt as they were brought here to have woken up in their own beds on the morning of October 7th and then to have been marched, many of them barefoot, in their pajamas deep down into the earth beneath Gaza. Tom. Okay, Raf Sanchez for us. Raf, thank you for your reporting. The war overseas continuing to spark tensions here at home. Tonight, a Texas community calling for hate crime charges for the stabbing of a Palestinian American father over the weekend. The incident unfolding just after a pro-Palestinian rally outside of the Texas state capitol in Austin. His family believes he may have been targeted over a traditional Arab scarf that was on his car. NBC's Zinclay Esamwa has the details.
This hate that's going around needs to stop. A Texas community outraged after 23-year-old Palestinian-American Zachariah Doar was stabbed outside the University of Texas Austin Sunday night following a demonstration calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. His friends called me saying, uncle, you need to come back. I said, what happened? He goes, somebody stabbed your son. Austin police arresting 36-year-old Burt James Baker, now charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Foul hate crime charges. But there are mounting calls for him to be charged with a hate crime. The attacker targeted the men because they had a kufiya, like the one I have, and a sign that read Free Palestine on their car. Doar's father, Nizar, says his son was in a car with three friends when Baker allegedly approached that car at a stop sign, pulled out a kafia scarf on the door handle, and tried to force open the door. My son sitting in the passenger side, he get dragged out of his feet to the ground. According to Nizar, his son and his friends tried to de-escalate the situation, but alleged Baker ran at one of them with a knife when Zachariah stepped in. My son charged and tried to protect his friend, tried to take the knife away. In the scuffle, he gets stabbed. We reached out to Baker's attorney. He has no comment at this time. In a statement, the Austin Police Department says it believes the incident is, quote, bias motivated and says its hate crime committee determined the case meets the definition of a hate crime. The Travis County District Attorney's Office will now decide if hate crime charges will be filed. Zachariah, a father to a five-month-old, is now recovering at home from a broken rib and a stab wound that narrowly missed his heart, according to his father. He, he want to be around his son, you know. Nizar's hopes going far beyond justice for his son, hoping for an end to the violence at home that he believes is fueled by the Israel-Hamas war. It's hunting us back here in our homeland. This is taking an effect on everybody around us right now. And the suspect, James Baker's next hearing, is set for February 23rd. We did ask the Travis County DA's office on whether or not they plan to prosecute this as a hate crime. They said they could not yet share details about timing at this time. Tom. Okay, Zinclay Esamwa for us tonight. Still ahead, chaos outside of Philly, a home erupting in flames as police responded to calls of a child shot. The suspect immediately opening fire when officers arrived, shooting two of them. What happened with this fire afterwards? Plus, a California high school student at risk of losing her vision after she was shot with a type of toy gun. The alarming trend that now has some lawmakers calling to ban the products. We're going to tell you about this. And quite the sight over Las Vegas today. Look at this. A man climbing to the top of the sphere. What we know about the daredevil tonight and why he did this. Stay with us. Back down with a warning about a popular kind of toy gun made popular by a viral TikTok trend. The plastic gun's typically loaded with tiny water beads, but those little beads can be huge, can be very dangerous. One California high school student now unable to see out of her right eye after she got caught up in a game her classmates were playing. NBC's Maura Barrett explains. Tonight, a high school student in California fearing she could lose vision in one eye forever after getting shot by a water bead loaded into a toy gun. The student, who wishes to remain anonymous, says she was sitting in her car in the school parking lot when she was hit. Part of the so-called Assassin's Game, an unsanctioned competition among seniors that involves students using toy guns to shoot at other students. I'm just sitting there like, oh my, like kind of like in shock, like I'm like worried like if it's like if my eye is bleeding like if there's something seriously wrong with my eye like some of her classmates used spring-loaded plastic guns like these loaded with water beads it's crazy how they grew so fast the toys exploding in popularity during the pandemic as the Orbeez challenge took over TikTok. TikTok made me buy it. Though it's not clear if Orbeez, a brand name of water beads, were used in this incident. I'm just like like and it's like distraught, like it hurt. The lawyer for the student's family says doctors diagnose the student with blunt force trauma and say it's unclear if she'll ever regain vision in her right eye. The student's family placing blame on the school district. We know that the school district had noticed that students were using these guns 
on campus. They had noticed even that this was happening during this school year. These concerns echoed by lawmakers and safety experts looking to ban the colorful water beads that can be used as ammo. But it's not just their use in guns. The beads, which grow in size when put in water, can be dangerous for small children who can easily swallow them. I know people are going to say to me, do you have to prohibit these completely? Aren't there some that are safe? The answer is no, there are none that are safe. We have to ban them. In a single small package, you can have 25, 50, or even 75,000 of these tiny beads. Uh, and it just takes one. Uh, to cause harm uh, to a child. Now, several major retailers like Amazon, Walmart, and Target have prohibited the sale of water beads marketed to children, according to the Consumer Federation of America. But similarly branded guns for the beads are still available online. Back in California, the injured student frustrated that her life has been altered over a game. It kind of discouraged me to go to school a little bit because, you know, you go there for your education and then you come home with one less eye. All right, Maura Barrett joins us now. Maura, these guns that shoot water pellets, are, are there age recommendations on them? And how would you compare them to something like a Nerf gun and the damage it can do if it, if it hits someone? Well, Tom, when you think of a Nerf gun, you think of those styrofoam pellets that if it hits you, it's annoying, but not super painful. Nerf actually makes what they call a gel blaster as well. And that's what these water bead toy guns are. They're actually compared to the power of an airsoft gun, but with a squishier, biodegradable, water-filled bead. And several ER doctors who reviewed the product say that it's still really dangerous because there's more power behind it. And so most of the brands gear the product towards more of a preteen age group recommended for 14 or up for the most part. And, and so the, the danger around these is actually we've seen in real life the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, actually pointing out that there's been nearly 8,000 cases, kids going to the ER either because of the issue around swallowing them or getting hit in the eye. Eye injuries are one that ER doctors called out the most. Now, I should note, I reached out to the school district involved in the story we were reporting on. They did not res respond, but they did post a warning to parents on the school website about the Assassin's Game and the risky behavior associated with it. Tom. Yeah, I'm glad we did this story to get that warning out there. Okay, more of Barrett for us. More, we appreciate that. Coming up inside one of the world's largest prisons, our partners at Telemundo getting rare access into El Salvador's mega prison that houses tens of thousands of alleged gang members. We hear from prison directors who call the inmates some of the most dangerous people in the country, but human rights activists say some of those incarcerated are actually innocent. We're going to explain it all. Stay with us. Okay, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with those police officers shot during a violent standoff in Pennsylvania. This is new aerial footage. It shows a home on fire just outside of Philly. Police say they were responding to reports of an 11-year-old shot when a suspect inside that home immediately opened fire on officers. Flames erupting as more officers arrived on the scene. So far, authorities have not been able to get inside. Both officers are expected to survive. A cargo train derailing in Colorado, spilling hundreds of gallons of diesel fuel. Officials say the train was carrying sugar when it derailed in Loveland. No one was hurt. Officials say the spill was contained and no waterways were contaminated. Crews are working to clean up all that fuel. And a man is in custody after he climbed the Las Vegas fear. You know what we're talking about, right? That new attraction? Well, you can see the man walking over to the top of the 366-foot tall venue before he descends. The man had been identified as a, quote, urban climber who scales bu buildings across the U.S. in protest of abortion. He was arrested in Vegas in 2021. No word on if the spear was damaged at all, but it comes as fans travel to the city for the Super Bowl in Vegas on Sunday. And Americans are struggling to afford rent as prices continue to skyrocket. New data from the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies found a record 22.4 million renters, which is about a half of all renters nationwide, spent more than 30% of their income on rent in 2022. According to the data from CashNet USA in cities like Miami and Boston, less than 10% of rental listings were considered affordable comparable to, to compare to the average salary in those cities. Okay, let's turn now to the Americas and a rare look inside Latin America's largest prison. Our partners at Telemundo going inside the controversial mega prison in El Salvador, that prison housing tens of thousands of gang members, most of them arrested after the country's president declared a war on crime. But as we've been reporting here on Top Story, human rights groups are concerned that some prisoners may have been unjustly detained without due process. 
Juan Venegas has the chilling images from inside. A late night visit in the heart of El Salvador. Telemundo cameras are given rare access to Latin America's largest prison. Inside this mega prison, you'll find some of El Salvador's most dangerous gang members packed into massive cells, towers of bunk beds, in what looks like bird cages. It's a source of pride for President Nayib Bukele that almost two years ago declared a war on crime. A detention center the size of seven football stadiums with capacity to hold 40,000 prisoners, the largest of its kind in Latin America. Known as the Center for Terrorism Confinement, it opened its doors in 2023 after the government declared a state of emergency. The move limiting civil rights and allowing massive arrest of tens of thousands of gang members. Aquí están esos que tanto luto y dolor en una the director says the detainees have to sleep on hard surfaces to avoid giving them mattresses that could be used to hide objects. Their diet consists of simple meals that repeat every day. Frijol, arroz, un huevo duro en la mañana. El menú del desayuno se repite en la cena. El almuerzo, el único que cambia, un poquito de pasta y arroz. It's all part of the president's tough stance on crime that some say solidified his re-election over the weekend, winning in a landslide, earning 70% of the vote. The government says the measures are working and the homicide rate has now dropped to 2.4%. This after just years ago, El Salvador was considered the most dangerous country in Central America. But the massive arrests have come with criticism. Under the current law, children as young as 12 can now be charged as adults. Also, mass trials can be held. And international watch groups say innocent people are being caught in the raids. Many sounding the alarm last year calling for transparency. We don't know if those who are being detained have committed a crime or are just there because they were tattooed and were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And for those who end up here, the director says there is no separation even between rival gangs, all sleeping in the same large cells with no rights to visitation. The dark side to the radical change that brought peace to the streets of a nation. Guad Venegas joins us tonight from Miami. Guad, incredible access there by our partners at Telemundo inside this prison complex. But, you know, sometimes, and I know you've done these embeds before, when you go in, you're not allowed to be everywhere. Uh, is there any concern about what we weren't able to see inside these prisons? Well, Tom, we've heard from a lot of these human rights watch groups. Uh, Amnesty International shared a report recently that they say includes details that come from former detainees. These detainees saying that there are a lack of essential services, uh, unhealthy conditions that can contribute to the spread of disease, even saying that some deaths of former prisoners could have been linked to these unhealthy conditions. Now, the president has admitted that these are harsh measures, but he's also said, Tom, that when the gangs ruled the streets of El Salvador, they did not take human rights into consideration. The president has gone as far as asking the human rights groups to come to El Salvador and take the gang members out of the country to a place where he says they can look after their human rights. So you can see the stance that's being taken by the president standing firm for, by his uh, decisions, Tom. Okay, Guad Venegas for us tonight. Guad, we thank you for that. Time to get a check of what else is happening around the world, which means it's time for Top Stories Global Watch. We start with that deadly Russian missile strike on Ukraine's capital. Four people were killed and more than 30 wounded in Kyiv following a strike on a residential building there. At least one other person was killed in a strike in the south. Ukraine says Russia fired 64 missiles and launched drones just today, damaging several power lines and gas lines. Protests erupting in Haiti as residents call for the prime minister to resign. Three days of fiery demonstrations have shut down banks, schools and government offices. The protests are against the U.N. elected government of prime, the prime minister who took over power shortly after the 2021 assassination of President Jovenel Moise. The latest administration has seen a rise in violent gangs, which has displaced some 300,000 Haitians. OK, switching gears here to something that's simply incredible. Look at this photo. It's a polar bear sitting on an iceberg, and it's just earned a top prize in photography. 
Now, you could see the bear there napping on the ice bed off the coast of Norway. It was taken by an amateur British photographer and is now the winner of this year's Wildlife Photographer of the Year People's Choice Award. Okay, that's a lot. According to organizers, a record 75,000 people voted in the competition. The photographer says she feels the image inspires hope in the midst of climate change. And a happy update to a story we brought you last night. It appears the pod of killer whales trapped in an ice drift off Japan's mainland has safely escaped. The 13 orcas were seen stuck in a tiny gap of ice Tuesday morning, sparking concerns, but officials say they were spotted north of the area last night and were gone by this morning. Experts believe that means they were able to free themselves from the ice as gaps grew wider. That is great news. Okay, coming up, no way out. An NBC News investigation finding nearly half of the victims of the Lahaina wildfires all lived in the same small neighborhood. So what went so wrong? And could their deaths have been prevented? That report next. Welcome back. It's been six months since devastating wildfires tore through the Maui town of Lahaina. Now an NBC News investigation reveals at least 43 of the fire's 100 victims lived in one small neighborhood trapped with no way out. Here's Steve Patterson. You look and, you know, you see that house on fire, that house on fire. Above the ruined remnants of Lahaina, Anthony Steele remembers those awful August flames. This was gridlock, this line on the road. <laughs> and for so many, the narrow escape. You need to go, bro. Yeah, go, go, go. The lifelong Maui resident lost three family-owned properties, his job, and the only place he's ever called home on August 8th. Steele says he's lucky he has his life. Many of his closest neighbors died that day, including his tenant and close family friend, Bernie Portabes. Do you remember the last thing he said to me? I'll drive you wherever we gotta go, is it? He just told me that he did, he's gonna stay a bit longer. It's very hard. Something I gotta live with, you know? An NBC News investigation discovered Portabes and at least 42 others who died in the Maui wildfires all lived in the same small neighborhood within Lahaina, a neighborhood of narrow streets and tight turns. You couldn't get a fire truck through my neighborhood, not on those sharp turns with everybody parking all horribly, you know. Satellite photos taken after the smoke cleared revealed a deadly bottleneck after a downed tree blocked one of the few ways out. We just can't get out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're working on the fire. I, all I can tell you is to get out of that area. The area, called Kahua Camp, was the remnant of once temporary housing built for workers growing sugarcane. The home's average size originally were only like 500 square feet. Crystal Smythe grew up in Kuhua Camp and says as families grew, so did the homes, and the neighborhood got more congested. It was already a one-lane road. They started parking on the streets because the homes were adding second stories. Some were adding cottages in the back. So it became more and more dangerous that way. NBC News spoke to more than 30 people, including current and former residents of Kahua Camp, to understand why it came to account for so many of the fire's fatalities. For years, residents say they complained about access issues, cars and boats blocking the streets, some fearing they may one day face the unthinkable. We're trapped right now. We're trapped. Then they did. Show. Maui County officials declined to comment on the neighborhood's long-running congestion and access problems. Though a spokesperson for the police department confirmed a dispatcher notified officers of a downed tree in the area, but said officers were busy elsewhere and it was not addressed. What does this kind of loss do to a community like this? It's definitely wounded. You are never, ever going to be the same. I know will never be the same. I know that for a fact. He does hope it can be safer one day when he rebuilds. We just want to go home. We can't go home, though. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Maui. And when we come back, another story of survival after a wildfire. The 75-year-old grandmother who lived through California's campfire now signing up to fight fires herself. Why she decided to volunteer and how it felt to go through the training in her 70s. Stay with us. Finally tonight, after her Northern California hometown was devastated by wildfires, a 75-year-old grandmother joining the ranks of her local volunteer fire department, all to serve a community that means everything to her. NBC's Kathy Park has that story. 
of the ashes of the 2018 campfire, one of the deadliest and most destructive natural disasters in California's history, emerged the newest volunteer firefighter, 75-year-old Mary Jarski. Sometimes people will say something like, oh, I'm old, and I'm like, well, yeah, that's going to happen to all of us, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we have to quit doing the things that we enjoy doing or, you know, quit being challenged. According to the Butte County Fire Department, anyone over the age of 18 who wants to help their community can join its volunteer firefighter squad, and Jarski fit the bill. But she knew the training wasn't going to be easy. I keep thinking, man, if I'd started when I was 30, I'd be so, just excuse the expression, badass. I mean, I'm still pretty badass at 75, but really, I, I wish I'd done it sooner. Every day I'd show up and say, I'm just gonna try. and. At the end of the day, um, yeah, no, I feel pretty proud of myself, actually. She was one of 19 cadets in the program, some of them nearly six decades her junior, all of them training for more than 200 hours. How demanding is the training program? It's fairly physical. They have to um, drag charged hose lines, wear heavy packs. We have our self-contained breathing apparatus that they have to wear. We do a live fire training. But Jarski is no stranger to pressure, spending 30 years on the front lines caring for others as a registered nurse. And she's hoping all that experience can be put to use in her new role. It takes time, I think, to develop and to be able to look at someone and assess them and um, kind of know what to do. And I, that's where I feel pretty confident. <sighs> Jarski plans to volunteer at the fire station in her hometown of Konkow after graduating from the program this weekend. And this grandmother is set to make history as the oldest cadet ever to complete the academy. I want people to see me out there and think to themselves, hey, maybe I could do that too because it's a, a great opportunity to, you know, we to serve your community and just, we need it. It doesn't bother me that I'm 75. I'm happy to be here. Proof that it's never too late to start something new. Kathy Park, NBC News. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.